Hi, this is Sharon from Fertility Network UK. Today we're holding this webinar uh, to take you through um, what's it like to go abroad for fertility treatment. And we've got Dr. Meski here from IVF Spain. Now, IVF Spain are a clinic uh, that are part of the Fertility Network Patient Pledge. Um, the Patient Pledge is almost a kite mark uh, for clinics. Um, it tells uh, you, um, the patient, the Fertility Network, trust this clinic, we work with this clinic, we know that this clinic offers a really high offer of emotional support uh, to support patients on their journey. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to Dr. Meske, but before I do, if you've got any questions, if you just look at the bottom of your screen, you might have to hover on your screen, you'll see a Q&A box. If you've got any questions, put those questions in the Q&A, and when Dr. Meske has finished her presentation, I'll come back on screen and I will ask Dr. Meske those questions. Okay, so I'm just going to hand over to Dr. Meske, who will take you through the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sharon, for your introduction. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Meski. So I'm a medical doctor at IVF uh, Spain, Madrid. And I'm very pleased to be here tonight and to present this webinar about IVF with donor eggs. So um, we are going to try to answer uh, two questions, essentially, tonight. So the first one is, should I try with my own eggs one last time? And the second one is when to decide about going for egg donation. So these two questions are very common when a patient undergoes a fertility treatment. And it's something that almost every patient asks herself uh, at some point. So the first step to take when you start a fertility treatment is to make a decision about which treatment is going to be the best for me and which one is going to give me the highest success rates. So how many times should I try with my own eggs and when should I stop trying regular IVF? So this is a, a very hard answer, uh, question to answer because uh, it's not always that simple. Officially, there is no limit set according to the law, at least here in Spain, in private clinics. So um, it's, it's very hard to say when should I stop trying regular IVF because it's really up to the patient. And of course, the physician is here to help and recommend the best treatment. However, every treatment, IVF treatment, means a big effort physically, psychologically, and of course, uh, financially. So when do you know that you have reached those limits. Maybe numbers and statistics can help. So as shown in this graph, uh, representing the percent of embryos with aneuploidy, that means uh, genetic abnormalities by female age, we can see clearly that um, starting 36 years old, the percent uh, increases exponentially. Okay, so and between 36 and 40 years old, there's a big jump, a big difference. So it does nothing but goes higher and higher. Um, at 42 years old, for example, a woman uh, has around 70% chances to have an embryo with aneuploidy. That means only one embryo out of four is going to be normal. In this other chart, you can see that the percent of normal blastocysts, that means a day five embryo, uh, according to the age, uh, that with egg donors, 61% of those embryos are going to be normal. Um, and that means without genetic abnormalities. The different gets bigger and bigger as we get uh, closer to 40 years old. And of course, over 40 years old, uh, the percent is very low. Over 42 years old, it's, uh, it equals 11%. So that means that the older women get, 
the more likely the embryos are to have a genetic defect. That's direct, directly related to the quality of the eggs. Poor egg quality generates low embryo quality and genetic abnormalities. So if you have already tried IVF several times with your own eggs, and there was always a poor quality of the embryos with uh, negative pregnancy tests or even miscarriages or even no transfer at the end because the embryos couldn't make it, maybe it's time you can ask yourself whether to keep trying that way or maybe take a different path. So what tests are there to find out if I have bad quality eggs or if there is another reason for implantation failure? There is no test that is able to tell us the exact quality of the egg because if we analyze the egg, we destroy it. So we cannot use it for IVF. But there is a test that can analyze the embryo, the quality of the embryo, and gives us information about the quality of the egg and the quality of the sperm because at the end an embryo is the union of the sperm and the egg. So the best way to know the quality of the egg is to analyze the embryo and that's called PGS. That means pre-implantational genetic screening. So basically when we do the embryo culture to uh, the blastocyst stage, that means to day five, the embryo is more developed, it has more cells. And instead of doing the embryo transfer, the embryologists will perform a biopsy on the embryo in order to get some cells, to take out some cells and analyze them genetically. So with this analysis, we can see the number of chromosomes that every embryo has to find out which embryo is normal and which embryo is aneuploid, has genetic defects. So when we do PGS, preimplantational genetic screening, we cannot do a fresh embryo transfer. So we have to freeze all embryos while we wait for the results because it can take up to three weeks. So here you can, you can see the success rates with PGS uh, according to treatments with uh, own, M o own eggs, sorry, and treatments with egg, don egg donor eggs. So um, you can see that with PGS, the success rates are higher than without PGS uh, in women over 35 year, years old, sorry, the, um, uh, percent, the percentage is around 18.3 uh, without PGS and it goes up to 81.1% with PGS. That's a huge difference. Of course, with donor eggs, a full cycle success rates with three transfers, that means three single embryo transfers, the success rates without PGS is in 93%. So it never reaches uh, the PGS with a patient over 35 years old, never reaches an egg donor treatment. So there's another test to see if there's uh, another problem besides the quality of the egg. It can be an implantation failure. And it's called the endometrial receptivity, the study of the endometrial receptivity. So that consists in finding the right implantation window. So we do uh, a cycle of preparation of the endometrium lining, just like when we do a frozen embryo transfer. So we start the first day of the period with estrogens treatment and after 10 days, we do an ultrasound scan to see if the lining is over seven millimeters, that's the minimum. If it's over seven millimeters, we can start the treatment with the progesterone. But then 
instead of doing the transfer on day five after uh, starting the progesterone treatment, what we do is a biopsy of the endometrium. We send the biopsy to be analyzed genetically to see the re receptors of uh, the endometrium to see if they're active or not. And uh, the results will tell us if uh, the endometrium is pre-receptive or if it's receptive or if it's post-receptive. So we can adjust the progesterone according to these results. If the endometrium is pre-receptive, that means that we need more days of progesterone. If it's receptive, that means that five days is perfect. Uh, and if it's post-receptive, that means that uh, we had too many progesterone, too much progesterone. So we have to do the transfer one day earlier or start with the progesterone one day earlier. With this same biopsy, there's also another test, and, and it's an immunology test called IMAP. That test uh, helps to find out if, there's, um, a, if there are white blood cells called natural killers inside the endometrium, which could attack the embryo because it, it identifies the embryo as a foreign body. So with this test, with the biopsy, the same biopsy, we can do both the receptivity window test and the IMAP test. So these are basically the main tests that we have to make sure that the quality of the egg is good and the implantational, the implantation failure is not uh, caused by the uh, window implantation or some immunology uh, immunological cause and who would you recommend the um, uh, egg donation to and when egg donation is the best choice at the first try so um, we have this graph that represents the percentage of transfers that resulted in live births for assisted reproductive treatment cycles using fresh embryos from own eggs and assisted reproductive uh, treatment cycles using fresh embryos from donor eggs by age of women. So the blue line represents the uh, donor eggs embryos and the uh, orange line represents the own eggs. So um, we can see clearly once again that the difference gets bigger uh, after 36 years old. So the treatment with own eggs gets uh, lower and lower success rates. That means uh, live births uh, starting 36 years old, uh, whereas the pregnancy range uh, rates, sorry, are remain remain the same with the donor eggs okay so i would recommend an egg donation treatment to women who want the highest success rates to want a live birth and um that are over 42 because we see clearly that uh the percentage falls to 10 percent at 42 uh, so uh, those women that are over 42 are clearly uh, patients for egg donations. Also, women that have poor or very low ovarian reserve with an AMH, that means the anti-mullerian hormone, uh, lower than 0 0.5, or also women who already tried IVF with their own eggs, several times as i said earlier and had no positive results so those are the indications uh in uh for a first uh try okay what are the steps of an egg donation would i have to be at the clinic for the entire time so let me get you through uh, a patient journey so first there is a first contact with the personal assistant
that we will answer all your doubts and also uh, give you an appointment to your first uh, visit with the physician. Then you can do the first visit. So during this first visit, it could be a Skype visit or it could also be an on-site visit. So if it's an on-site visit, we can do all kinds of tests. We can do the ultrasound scan, we can do uh, blood tests with all the hormones. We can also do a preliminary transfer test. That means that we are going to try to do a transfer, uh, just like a trial transfer. And of course, the physician has to get you a diagnosis and give you a personal treatment plan. And uh, he can give you also all the medical prescriptions and required documents like consents, for example. Then, uh, once you make your decision, we can get ready for the embryo transfer. That means the hormonal treatment. So, as I explained in the window implantation uh, receptivity endometrial treatment or test, uh, the treatment always starts with a period. If the patient does not have her period, uh, has already menopause, uh, we can always uh, trigger the period or even uh, start without the period. But usually we start with the, the first day of the period. And then we start with estrogens. And after 10 to 12 days, we do the first scan. So this part you can do at home. You, you don't have to be at the clinic. So we are used to uh, get in touch with our patients by email. They can send us all the results and we can tell them how to keep doing the treatment. So once we get uh, a good lining over seven millimeters, then we can, um, we can do, we can program or plan the embryo transfer. Then the patient comes for the embryo transfer. So here is the, the, the point where the patients have to come to Spain. So um, he can stay, the patient, they can stay in a, in a hotel that all arrangements can be made for you. And the day of the embryo transfer, you have to be at the clinic and then you can leave the day after. We always recommend that the same day of the embryo transfer, you stay uh, on site and you, you just do a, a very, um, uh, lo very low exercise effort. So uh, you, you get relaxed for that day. And then you can go, go back afterwards. Then the final um, step is the outcome of the treatment. So we will tell you when to do the pregnancy test and then you can give us the results by email and we will have another, um, another uh, appointment to talk about the result. So now the, the most important thing is to select the egg donor because all this treatment, the part of getting ready for the embryo transfer, it has to be synchronized with the donor treatment. So here is uh, to give you an idea about how we select the donors in Spain. So in our clinic, we have around 500 donors each year. So um, there's a, a legal obligation that means we have to legally select the, the donor according to the phenotype combination together with the husband. So uh, you have to fill a form where you can uh, describe yourself, give us all the phenotype uh, details about your hair, skin, eye color, your body mass index, and of course, send us also a picture, a picture of your face and a picture of your body. So. This gets us down to 100 donors. So we always uh, do a selection. So we get uh, down to less number of donors and then it's up to the availability, availability of the donor. So before that, there's also a doctor's approval. So the doctor is always the one that gets the approval that compares the photo also because the doctor is the one who knows uh, the patient and who have seen the patient. So he decides which donor 
is the best match. And uh, when we get down to uh, a small number of donors, um, between two and four, then it has to be also uh, according to the availability of the donor. So the donors, uh, by law, also cannot um, have a limited time of egg donation. So uh, it's limited to six births. That also includes their own children. So yearly, around 150 donors leave the donor pool. That, that means they cannot donate anymore. And there's also another way to select the donor. That's the genetic matching. So I already told you about the traditional matching. That means the phenotype matching, also the guarantee of the ethnic affiliation, the law also, uh, it also um, tell us to, to follow all these, all these uh, steps in order to, assign you uh, an egg donor. But there's also a genetic matching. That means there's um, um, a test, a blood test that we perform on the donor to see if she carries uh, a genetic disease. That includes uh, cystic uh, fibrosis, uh, fragile X syndrome, muscular dystrophy, that's uh, the type of disease, genetic disease, that is included in this uh, carrying um, uh, genetic disease panel. So once we do that test on the donor, we also have to do it on the, on the husband or the, if it's a, a single woman on the, uh, sperm the sperm donor. So then we do the matching. So we know if both of them um, ha are carrying the same genetic disease uh, so if it's the case we have to change the donor okay so that guarantees also that there will be no genetic relation between uh, uh, there will be no genetic coincidence between uh, both of the donor and the, the male uh, because if there is a coincidence if they are both carrying the same genetic disease, that means that there is a 25% chance that uh, the child has a genetic disease. That means it triggers the genetic disease. He is no longer a carrying, he will be uh, uh, affected by the, the disease, okay? So also another way to uh, do a better selection of the embryo and of the, the to, to guarantee uh, a better result of the treatment is a blastocyst guarantee. That means that when we do a treatment with um, egg donor, we guarantee that we will have a blastocyst, at least uh, three blastocysts. So the difference between a day three embryo and a day five embryo is very clear in the picture. You see that um, day three embryo has around eight cells and a day five embryo, that's the blastocyst, has around 200 cells. So when we do uh, an IVF with, uh, with the patient's own eggs, we cannot guarantee that. We cannot guarantee that we will get a blastocyst. And so um, when we do a treatment with the egg donor, we do guarantee that we have a blastocyst. That's also a natural selection and uh, a better quality embryo. Also, another way to select the embryo is uh, the time lapse. We have tools to make sure that the embryo is uh, better selected. That's a non-invasive embryo monitoring technology. It's called time lapse or embryoscope, and it helps the experts, that's the embryologists, to know which embryo achieved the best cell division during its development. So basically, it's like um, an incubator with a camera that will record the whole uh, a cell division between the day of the fertilization until the day five 
that's the day of the transfer, the embryo transfer. So the embryologists know all the details about how those cells uh, are dividing and how the development of the embryo is, is doing. And they don't need to get the embryo out, look at it at a microscope and get it inside the incubator once again. So the, the embryo is uh, always under the same conditions those conditions have to be the same as in a uterus. That's basically an incubator is like an artificial uterus. So if the embryos don't go in and out, they have a better uh, quality. So an IVF with egg donor is a pragmatic solution. So we um, guarantee you efficiency, safety because uh, the quality of the embryos are, is better and also uh, the genetic uh, defects are very low with uh, egg donor uh, uh, treatments. And also it's um, psychologically, I think it's also uh, better because the, um, the weight, all the weight of the of the treatment is off the patients. The, the, at the end, the child will have a genetic father and a physical mother. And in Spain, the law is, has been regulated uh, for egg donor uh, treatments since 1988. So here uh, I finish my presentation and uh, thank you for your attention. I hope it helped uh, understanding the treatment a little bit more and uh, maybe we can start with the uh, Q&A's. Uh, Sharon, do, do you know if we already have some questions? Can you see me again here? We can see you. <laughs> okay, so I don't have any questions coming through on screen, but I've got quite a number of questions here that were sent to me in advance. Um, so firstly, as you can imagine, COVID has, is quite a big issue just now. So I've had a few patients ask me, if they can get to Spain, do they need to quarantine on arrival in Spain? Okay, yeah, I know that uh, this situation is very stressful for everyone. Even for us, it's very hard to know what is going to happen. But as, uh, for now, as far as we know, patients don't need to do a quarantine in Spain. They need, so what we ask uh, them is to send us um, her, their tests. So we ask them to perform a COVID test before they get into Spain. And if it's negative, there's absolutely no need to do a quarantine. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, another COVID question. Mm -hmm. If COVID levels are high in Spain, how will the clinic guarantee that I'll be kept safe between arriving in Spain and an embryo transfer? Is there a protocol that you would expect the patient to follow to ensure that they don't catch COVID in that interim period? Yeah, so um, I, I, there again, it's very difficult to guarantee that the, the treatments are going to keep uh, their normal uh, ways, but even in the first lockdown, I call it first, I hope there won't be a second one, but during the lockdown, we didn't stop doing the treatments. So what we did was uh, give the patients um, a certificate that they were undergoing a treatment they, 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 that they cannot um, suspend, that they cannot cancel, and that uh, helped them uh, get to Spain. Also, um, COVID does not, uh, is not present in the, in the eggs, not, nor in the, in the sperm. So there's absolutely no chance that the embryos can get uh, uh, infected by COVID. But if the patient shows symptoms, if uh, the patient has fever, 
we uh, do not do the embryo transfer. That's because it lowers the possibilities, the chances, because fever is something that is not good for the embryo and it could also uh, lead to uh, miscarriages. So that's the only step that we didn't do uh, during the, the lockdown. Uh, the whole treatment with the donor uh, is, is done. Uh, there's absolutely no problem with the eggs and the sperm. So uh, basically what we did was uh, to freeze all the embryos and wait if the patient showed symptoms. Otherwise, we did the whole treatment. Okay, thank you. I think that's all my COVID questions. Uh, I think I've got another question here, and it's what is the law on anonymity in Spain? So here in the UK, if you get donor eggs, uh, anyone that donates eggs or sperm has to register, and that a potential child has got the right to find out who those donors are. If I'm a UK patient and I'm getting donor eggs or sperm in Spain, do I, does that child have that access in the future? So uh, for now in Spain, all donations uh, are strictly anonymous. That means you will never know the identity of the donors and the donor will never know the identity of the, of the patients. Uh, the donors, the egg donors have to be at least 18 years old and uh, not over 35 years old and all kind of tests are performed on on the donors so that's what the law um, um, is um, is is uh, for now that's what the law uh, asks all the clinics the fertility clinics so if there's a, a problem with the child uh what we do is uh that we get in touch with the donor if there's some additional um genetic uh test that we have to do we do that uh and not the so in any case the patient won't have any uh contact direct contact with the with the donor okay thank you another question here and it's uh, what is the law in Spain in relation to the upper age limit of both partners getting a treatment and do you have an upper age limit in law? Um, so do you mean like uh, same-sex patients for example? No I've got another question on same-sex, no I mean if I've got a female and she's 51 would she be eligible for donor eggs? Do you have a maximum age in Spain? Yes, the maximum age is 35, but I have to say that in our clinic, at least, the age, the maximum is set at 30 years old. So, Sorry, Dr. Meske, I think I'm at the, the language barrier here. No, I mean for the recipient, do you have a, a maximum age? Okay, for the recipient, okay. So, no, there's the law doesn't set any limit, but the clinics, they do. Usually, it depends on, on the clinic. So, in our clinic, we set the, the, the limit at 53. So, 53 patients at 53, they cannot do the, any kind of treatment in our clinic. So, you see that the range is very wide, but it's also because uh, we need to get a healthy pregnancy. The the main um, goal is not just to uh, do a treatment and uh, uh, to get the, the, the patient pregnant. The main goal is to get a healthy pregnancy and a healthy child, a live birth. So the limit is in our clinic set at 53. Okay, thank you. You kind of touched on same sex. I have had a number of queries from same sex females and also single females. Do you treat these women with egg donation? Yes, of course. So uh, here in Spain, again, uh, the law allows same sex female patients um, to do a treatment. So it could be IVF, it could be egg donation, of course, that that depends on the age, the age, sorry, 
and also uh, the ovarian reserve. So uh, there's absolutely no problem for same-sex uh, patients, female patients, to do a treatment. There's also um, a treatment that it's called ROPA. That means that um, if uh, a same-sex uh, female patients uh, want to do a treatment with their own eggs, they can do, uh, one can be the donor and the other one would be the recipient. So that's also something that the law allows to do here in Spain. Unfortunately, there's no treatment for same-sex uh, male patients because the um, uh, surrogacy is not allowed uh, by the law. Okay, thank you. Um, a number of clinics in the UK have got set BMI limits that they impose on recipients. Do you have a set BMI limit? So, um, theoretically, we do have a, a BMI limit and it would be uh, 30, but I have to say that we also compromise. I mean, the law does not uh, set a limit in private clinics. Of course, it's something else in uh, social security, but in private clinics, uh, that, that's up to the physician. If uh, the patient is in uh, good health and uh, all the blood tests are normal, and uh, if the, the access to the, um, to the uterus uh, when we do the preliminary uh, transfer uh, trial is, um, is a very easy, then we can do the treatment even if the patient has a, a high BMI, higher than 30. Okay, thank you. You talked earlier in the slide presentation about a semen analysis and blood tests. If I've recently been through a cycle in, here in the UK, would those results suffice or would I have to have them redone? Um, no. If the results are uh, less than uh, a year, uh, within the, uh, less than a year, there's absolutely no need to do the, the, those analysis here in Spain again. You can send us all your uh, mm -hmm. tests, all your analysis, and we can see if there's something that we have to be uh, that's something that it has to be redone or not. Uh, usually, the only um, tests that are um, that has like a limit, a um, date limit, is the serology, all the infectious disease, uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, syphilis. So those are the tests that have a limit of six months. But otherwise, all the tests, if they are within a year there's absolutely no problem. What we do when the patient get uh, to the first visit here in Spain, and uh, they are physically here, that means an on-site first visit, uh, we always do um, a sperm, a f uh, we always freeze a sperm sample. That's just because we want to have that sample just in case there's a problem with the flight on the day of the uh, egg don donor uh, egg retrieval, or if um, the husband cannot come due to work, or if uh, he has fever or any kind of disease just on the day of the egg donor retrieval. So we always freeze a sperm sample. Okay, thank you. Now I've got some questions here. Um, I'll jump to the second one first. Um, I've got uh, someone whose partner is Eritrean and they're wondering, are you able to source eggs from different ethnicities? Yes, absolutely. So we do have a wide um, um, kind of uh, ethnicities. So um, here in Spain, in Madrid, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big city, a lot of immigration. We have all kind of uh, nationalities. I cannot guarantee that the donor will be from Eritrea. That's something that is very, uh, um, very uh, hard to guarantee, but at least to match the same phenotype. So 
uh, if it has the same skin color, same eye color, same uh, hair, kind of hair also. So um, there won't be a problem in that case. But if the patient wants to, the donor to be specifically from Eritrea, that's gonna take probably some more time because uh, it's not uh, very often that we see patients from Eritrea. Okay. Uh, I've got a patient in Ireland. I'm not sure if it's Northern or the Republic. Um, they're asking, do you link with any clinics in Ireland where they could get initial scans? Sorry, I, I didn't get the, the, the question. So we've got a, a question here from someone in Ireland. Uh -huh. And they're wanting to know, do you have any clinics that you work with in Ireland where they could get initial tests or screening done? Um, that uh, I'm not sure, as uh, we don't know if it's Northern or, or uh, Southern Ireland, but um, we do have some clinics that we work with in UK, but I'm not sure about where exactly. That's something that the assistants are uh, very, uh, very, uh, uh, they will assist you to through the whole treatment and they will always try to find a way for you, a clinic or a physician that we can work with uh, in, um, in UK. Now, I don't know exactly where, so that's mostly uh, the assistant uh, job so uh that's why i'm not very uh, uh updated about that i'm i'm sure um, i know in scotland the ivf spain use a um, gcrm uh, yeah. clinic which is part of the fertility partnership and we do have one of those their clinics in northern ireland and belfast as well uh, yeah. and they're a sister clinic to the one in glasgow so i, I, I would be fairly confident that that would probably be somewhere that you could go and get initial scans and tests done. Exactly, yes, I'm sure also, but I just didn't want to give some information that, I, that I'm not very uh, sure about it. <laughs> and the last question I've got here, unless any more come in, um, how much will it cost for a donor IVF cycle? Yeah. I know that uh, uh, finances are very, very important in uh, IVF treatment. So uh, that again, it's the uh, assistants that uh, give all the details about the uh, uh, financial, uh, the cost of the treatments. I just can give you an idea because uh, the prices also change. Sometimes we have discounts, sometimes we have, uh, uh, some new treatments, some new, uh, I don't like to, to say pack because uh, it sounds too commercial, but we also do have different type of guarantee treatments. So that's why uh, it's, uh, it, can, it can change. We can have a, a treatment with uh, a guarantee of three, up to three blastocysts and another one that has, that can guarantee you up to five blastocysts. So the difference uh, is of course the cost. I can just tell you that the cost is around 10,000 maybe, I'm not sure. But if you want more details about this, please send us an email. You have our email address uh, here on the last slide and uh, you can uh, contact us and one of us uh, one of our assistants will be very happy to help you and i've got another question that i've actually just been messaging i've got another one up on the slide yeah sure. when you mentioned earlier that after the first visit you will issue the patient a with a prescription for the drugs they need would that be a spanish prescription or a uk prescription Yes, we always give the prescription uh, according to the patient, to where the patient is from. So when we work with uh, French patients, we always give them a uh, French prescription. And when we work with uh, UK uh, patients, we give them the, the English or the UK prescription. So the name of the 
of the drugs or the hormones are all always in the uh, available in the country of the of the patient. Another question here: What is the policy for um, a two embryo transfer? So. Is it always single embryo or is the patient given a choice? Can they have two embryos transferred? Yes, so we do uh, give our recommendations. So the recommendation will always be up to uh, the physician. He will give you the best advice because um, he will know uh, what are the chances, what are the risks for um, multiple pregnancy especially um, uh, according to the age of the patient and also to the whole um, um, health of the patient. If the patient has fibroids or some uh, disease or anything that could uh, be dangerous during the pregnancy, of course, we will always recommend one uh, single embryo transfer. But if... Um, if there's absolutely no problem, no health issues, and the patient wants to uh, do a two embryo transfer, there, there's absolutely no problem. Everything is written in the consents, so uh, the ultimate decision is always the patient's. Thank you. Back on to the prescriptions. Um, can you post the prescription from Spain over to a UK patient? And also, the drugs that are on the, the prescription you write, are they available in the UK? Um, yes, so usually, it depends also on, on the, the country, but I know that uh, what we were uh, talking about earlier, about if there's a um, uh, clinic that we uh, call, Co collaborate or that we work with uh, so usually you, we give you a prescription and sometimes you have to take that prescription to your doctor or to the clinic that we work with and he will give you a UK prescription that you can use directly to the pharmacy um, usually we give you the name of the medication uh, in, U in the UK, so there's uh, absolutely no problem to find those medication. Okay, thank you. I've got uh, another question here. If my husband has low sperm motility, mm -hmm. can I still, can I get IV done, the donor egg done by ICSI? Well, Yes, actually, it's recommended that uh, when the uh, spermogram or the semen analysis is uh, uh, is abnormal, we recommend ICSIs. That means the intracytoplasmic or cytoplasmic uh, injection of sperms. So, if the motility is low, um, the doing ICSI, we, we will select the better sperm, the, the sperms with the higher, higher motility. So that's uh, the embryologist uh, will select the sperms one by one, um, uh, depending on the motility, also on the morphology, the aspect, the, how the sperm look like, and that those that look the, the the best the better those will be selected to inject them inside the uh, egg so of course it will be recommended to do an ICSI when the motility is low thank you could you tell me how long is the patient journey from initial consultation to embryo transfer do you have an idea of that time frame Yes, so when we do the, the treatment plan, that means that we will give you uh, a frame, a time frame. Uh, the most important thing is to synchronize both cycles, the patient cycle and also the donor cycle. So they both go on the same page and the day that 
the donor gets the egg retrieval, the patients have to be physically here at the clinic, so um, the sperm sample is, is done. That's why we give you a time frame because we can, um, we can try to uh, give you an exact uh, date of the donor uh, egg retrieval, but sometimes it's hormonal. So uh, sometimes it could be delayed by one day or at the contrary, it could be um, uh, one day earlier. So uh, we always give you a time frame, and that's uh, mostly around a week. So it's uh, you have to be here on the day of the egg retrieval, and then you know that we do a blastocyst stage culture. So five days after the uh, egg retrieval, we do the transfer. So we always give you around one week. Uh, so we have uh, two days uh, just in case. So do you have a, a wait list just now? If I um, phoned tomorrow and spoke to your sales, how long would it be? You'd be able to schedule me in for that first consultation. So there's absolutely no uh, waiting list. So once you, you get in touch with the, with the medical assistant, we give you an appointment as soon as possible. Uh, it could be uh, the day after if the physician is available or uh, within the week, the same week. And then um, once you take the decision to start the treatment, you have to... Um, count around uh, a month because uh, the donor selection is going to take about two weeks then the preparation with the both uh, cycles the donors and the patients is going to take another two to three weeks so it's a little more than a month from the first visit and the first day that we um, decide to start the treatment until the day of the embryo transfer. Thank you. Another question here. What happens if the blastocyst transfer falls on the weekend or a Sunday or a bank holiday? Is the clinic open? Yes, so uh, we do have um, shifts, we do shifts. So uh, there is always, there will always be a, a physician uh, that um, that can uh, attend you and uh, uh, do the embryo transfer on the weekends. So the uh, clinic is always open. Can you choose to have a frozen cycle? Absolutely. If for any kind of reason you do not want to do a fresh embryo transfer or you cannot do a fresh embryo transfer, you can choose to do a freeze all cycle. That means that we will make the embryos and we will freeze them. So for that, we have to do, we have to, we, we have to have the sperm. So either you come here before and you leave a sperm sample. So we freeze the sperm sample. Or of course, if we if uh, you you do a treatment with a, a sperm donor, so uh, that's absolutely no problem. We select the donor as uh, the same as we select the egg donor, and uh, and then uh, we freeze all the embryos, and you can come whenever you want to do the embryo transfer. If I <coughs> if I wanted to make sure that I had further embryos from the same genetic donor could I do like um, that at the beginning so that I could make sure that if I wanted to come back to have siblings they had the same genetic uh, donor yes exactly as I was um, saying earlier there are well, I'm gonna say it, packages so that means that there are different kind of uh, treatment with different kind of costs. So if you want to have um, several children and with the same donor, there is um, um, a special treatment that is called uh, family planning. 
that means that we will guarantee you more MBOs. So uh, at the end, you're going to have uh, more opportunities. And if you get pregnant uh, within the second try, the second embryo transfer, you will get other embryos. Those other embryos will be frozen and they can be frozen when how many, many, much time you want. If you want them to be frozen during two years or three years until you want an, another child. So uh, that's um, a treatment called family planning. Thank you, Dr. Meske. I think that's all of the questions I've got just now. I've covered all these ones here and I don't see any coming up on the screen. I would just like to thank Dr. Meske and IVF Spain. This has been a really informative presentation and I think and hope others that view this will be able to see the, the journey to parenthood um, is, is fairly straightforward and actually going to a, a clinic like IVF Spain. Uh, if you go on their website, you'll see it's really informative. Uh, the pricing on packages that Dr. Meske has been talking about are all there for you to see. Um, uh, and, and thank you, Dr. Meske. Uh, one thing I'd like to say to anybody that's listening, um, Fertility Network's here to support you on your emotional journey. So if you need to speak to me regarding anything in relation to what you've heard today or anything you're struggling with uh, emotional needs, then give me a call and, and I'll be able to support you or put you in touch with one of my colleagues that could do likewise. So thank you, Dr. Meske your time and, and I hope I've just found this presentation really useful. Thank you very much, Sharon. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.